second half of January 1943. Total war, a euphemism for a war without restraint. In the second half of January, the German Nazis seem to think that it is only now that they will bring total war on their enemies. How can it be any more total than what they have already done? And even if they can escalate, is Germany in any practical situation at this point to do any worse than they already have? Moreover, aren't the Allies in Casablanca about to preempt them and decide that there shall be no restraint in the war on Germany? Whatever the answer is, the present rhetoric on all sides does not bode well for millions of people in harm's way. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. As the new year began, the German slave system was once again expanded. While Himmler ordered extermination of the remaining Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto after he visited and was angry that the Jews had been enslaved for now and not yet murdered. The Jewish resistance began plotting resistance there. The world learned the detailed numbers of the Holocaust in 1942 in the Höfle telegram, while hunger is gripping Europe, starvation is looming in India, and already reaping hundreds of thousands of lives in China. In Casablanca, Morocco, the United Nations Alliance have come together to discuss the continuation of their war effort, especially on Germany. And while the Allied effort to bring total war to Germany has only barely begun, the German people are already seeing possible doom for their war effort on the horizon. Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels writes on the 16th, The German people are starting to see that there are problems on the Eastern Front. Our propaganda is failing. We can't take away the worry. He is, of course, speaking of public opinion about the pending failure at Stalingrad. But it is not only there that things are not improving for the Germans, which is fortunate for those caught in their vice, like in Leningrad, where Operation Iskra comes to an end. The Soviets have broken through the German grip on Lake Ladoga. For now, it's only a corridor with a width of five miles at most, but it is enough to start construction of a railway line into the city and to lift the spirits of the Leningraders to new heights. In his diary this month, Goebbels speaks of parasites and profiteers who still won't realize that this war is about our survival. But it would seem that there are more Germans than just criminals who are preoccupied with other stuff. Life goes on, even in war times. In their report, the SS complain of increasing misbehavior of the 14 to 18 age segment in towns and cities. They are especially distressed at youngsters disregarding normal courtesy, not yielding their seat to pregnant women and elderly on public transportation, refusing to take off their hats indoors, cursing, and making fun of people on the street. They make a special point of the problem of masses of teenage girls trespassing the 18 age limits on bars and restaurants, staying out late into the night courting soldiers, getting drunk, and being a general nuisance. It seems that the Nazi control machine is losing its grip on the younger generations. A civil servant is met with especially disrespectful behavior by a 16-year-old. The boy cashes a slap across the face. Unfazed, he coldly responds, How dare you! One does not strike the Führer's children. But what concerns the SS the most is the same as Goebbels, that the Nazi propaganda is not able to hide the fact that the war is not going favorably. And on the 21st, Goebbels acknowledges the dire situation to himself and concludes that the German people must be informed. I don't think that during this war or the last world war we have experienced a similar military catastrophe. We must start to consider how to inform the German population of the situation in Stalingrad. We should have already, but the Führer wouldn't have it. Three days later, the Nazi press speaks for the first time of a looming defeat at Stalingrad. A potential defeat that the Nazis don't see as cause to change their plans. To the contrary, they are planning to double down. Goebbels writes, Stalingrad must become for us what Alcazar was for the Spanish freedom fighters, a tragic and heroic epic about the German soldiers. I am of the opinion that this image will bring the German people closer to our regime. 
In line with total war, it's necessary to harden the German people from the inside and outside, no matter what. Whether or not Goebbels is able to harden the Germans and bring total war on their opponents, those opponents are about to do their devil best to bring total war on Germany. On the 16th, only days before Goebbels muses about total war, the RAF attempt their heaviest bombardment of Berlin since the war began. 190 Lancaster and 11 Halifax bombers set out with a parting message from their boss, temporary Air Marshal Arthur Harris. Tonight you are going to the big city. You will have the opportunity to light a fire in the belly of the enemy that will burn his black heart out. Goebbels writes in his diary on the 17th, for the first time in a while, Berlin has been heavily bombed. The damages are, compared with other cities, limited. And indeed, the Allies are disappointed by their strike. The night is cloudy, navigation is poor, and most bombs fall scattered in the southern part of the city. The Brits failed to destroy significant buildings or large numbers of homes. For such a failure, the casualty rates are relatively high, though. The German air defenses are unable to predict the scale of the incoming attack, and most anti-air crewmen are out on a training mission. To make things worse, the air sirens only go off as the first bombs start hitting the ground. 198 people die, among which one British and 52 French prisoners of war. In response, the next day, the Luftwaffe conducts its first night raid on London since May 1941. With much of the Luftwaffe's force concentrated in the east, only a few dozen bombers, many of them reserves, are able to carry out the raid. And they are met with a fierce wall of anti-aircraft artillery, causing many pilots to drop their bombs far from the city center. Instead, the main German method for retaliation is becoming targeted terror attacks. On the 20th, 28 Focke-Wulf fighter bombers set out to bomb any target suitable for a terror angriff. One airplane commander spots a large building in southeast London. He drops his 500 kilo bomb, creating a huge explosion and destroying a large part of the construction. Intentionally or not, he has just bombed the Sandhurst Road School, where lessons are underway. 38 school children and six teachers are killed, with many more wounded. This is yet another taste of the tit-for-tat that will come from decisions like at the secret United Nations Conference in Morocco. On the 24th, the Casablanca Declaration is issued. It's a multi-layered declaration, but in essence, it comes down to one thing. The Axis will face total destruction until they surrender unconditionally. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt equivocates, though, it does not mean the destruction of the population of Germany, Italy, or Japan, but it does mean the destruction of the philosophies in these countries, which are based on conquest and the subjugation of other people. These words create some tension at the conference, which is, after all, taking place in a French colonial dominion. Sultan Mohammed V of Morocco approaches Roosevelt and questions why Morocco, inhabited by Moroccans, should belong to France. Questions that remain unanswered, as does the question of how to destroy a people's philosophy without destroying the peoples themselves. On the 27th, the first U.S. Army Air Force bombing of Germany follows. The 8th Air Force sets out to Wilhelmshaven port in Lower Saxony with a total of 91 B-24 bombers and B-17 flying fortresses. The majority reach the harbor and drop up to 140 tons of bombs, destroying warehouses, docks, and submarine bases. You might remember that the U.S. Army Air Force has previously tried to carry out precision bombing using better targeting scopes. As of the Casablanca Declaration, precision bombing is now to mean the selection of precise targets for daytime bombing, rather than dropping bombs precisely on targets which has proven impossible. The RAF Bomber Command under Harris will continue nighttime general targeting of German cities, while the USAAF 8th Army under mission control by Colonel Karl Spatz will focus on precise targets during the day. It's a 
rift in strategy that represents two truly different ideas. The U.S. is focusing on the preparation for invasion by destroying military and industrial targets, while Great Britain is focusing on breaking the German spirit to wage the war by targeting Germany and Germans in general. Before Casablanca, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill considered trying to convince U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt to have both sides focus on the wholesale destruction through nighttime area bombing. It was Brigadier General Ira Eaker in overall command of the Eighth Army that turned Churchill around in a one-page memo that concluded that if the RAF continues night bombing and we bomb by day, we shall bomb them round the clock and the devil shall get no rest. Immediately after the conference, Harris summarizes his achievements so far and communicates his goals. His plan is to devastate one city and to damage three others every month from now to September. When Harris' boss, chief of the air staff Charles Portal, presents the plan to Eker, Eker remains skeptical of both feasibility of the tactical goals and of the promised effect. As February begins, there is no agreement on overall strategy. Meanwhile, in Germany, Eker's doubts seem to get confirmed even before a combined plan is in place. Goebbels may not have managed to stir the German people into total war yet, but the increased bombing activity seems to be playing into his agenda. At the end of the month, the SS Situation Report again claims that living under bombardment and seeing Germany strike back is hardening the Germans into supporting the war. They conclude that, the prompt retaliation on London has, on the other hand, triggered great satisfaction everywhere. They go on to note that the population want retaliation, not only for attacks on Berlin, but any German city. But while Germany is meeting more and more resistance on multiple fronts, the Nazis are not about to give up. In the Balkans, mainly occupied Yugoslavia, that means dealing with what they perceive as a lethal threat by Tito's partisans. The perceived threat is both strategic, partisans could support a possible allied invasion through the Balkans, and ideological, eradication of the communists. On the 8th, German General Oberst Alexander Löhr and Italian commander Mario Ruata finalizes a plan to crush any resistance. Their perceived urgency is underlined when the partisans launch an attack on Croat puppet government-held positions in northern Bosnia the same day. By some accounts, this is not coincidence, but the result of the plans being picked up by Tito's forces. 90,000 Axis troops, consisting of German, Italian, and Croats, are mustered, in addition to roughly 12,000 Chetnik forces. Together, they face between 25 and 30,000 experienced and fairly well-equipped partisans. The plan, codenamed Fall Weiss, or Case White, has three parts. Weiss Eins, destroy partisan formations in western Bosnia. Vice 2, deal with partisans in central Bosnia. Vice 3, attack the partisans in Herzegovina. At the end of Vice 3, the Germans also secretly plan to disarm and neutralize their co-belligerents, the Chetniks. Vice 1 is launched on January 20th. The German 369th, 717th, and 714th Infantry Divisions, supported by the Prince Eugen SS Mountain Divisions and the Croat 2nd and 3rd Home Guard Mountain Brigade, descend on partisan positions in western Bosnia from the north and the east, while three Italian divisions, together with the 31st, 32nd, and 34th Ustasha Brigades, attack from the south and the Dalmatian coast all supported by Luftwaffe air power. Chetnik forces from Lika, northern Bosnia, northern Dalmatia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro start fighting from inside to infiltrate partisan-held territory in each region. The operation is, however, not the steamroller that has been hoped for. Axis formations are under-equipped, perform below expectations, and the partisan defenses hold firm in many places. Now, the partisans have been planning on an offensive of their own towards the east and southeast of Bosnia later in the spring. But Tito hastily moves it up and launches it as a counterattack shortly after Falweis begins. Towards the end of January 1943, partisan troops start pushing towards Neretva, preemptively thwarting the Axis plans. Success or not, from the very start, the campaign is brutal. 
Back on December 16th last year, Hitler ordered ruthless retaliation against any resistance by the most brutal means against women and children also. On January 12th, Croatia commands issues an order stating that every measure that ensures the security of the troops and appears to serve the purpose of pacification is justifiable. No one should be held to account for conducting themselves with excessive harshness. But it is the Chetniks who are especially ruthless against their ethnic enemies, Muslims, Croats, and Bosnians. The Germans see this as a further destabilizing factor in the area. Only they should be allowed to murder at will. But the Italians support the Chetnik, and they stay in the fight. And while the anti-partisan alliance begin their ruthless campaign, the Nazi war on the defenseless Jews continues. Ostensibly, the increased pace of killing of Operation Reinhardt should have ended in December. The Bevchech extermination factory has closed down, but Treblinka and Sobibor continue operations, and gassing at Auschwitz has not ended. Despite deciding for enslavement on paper, as we have seen Himmler, is of two opinions. Like when he expanded Operation Reinhardt to include the Bialystok district as well, and that has not been emptied of Jews yet nor as many other parts of Europe, and the deportations to be murdered by forced labor or gas continue. On January 22nd, in Marseille, France, 4,000 Jews are detained for transport to the extermination factories in Poland. But under pressure from the air and in the east, German logistics are straining to keep up with the war itself, let alone the war against humanity. And on the 23rd, Himmler writes a letter to the German transport ministry asking for more trains. He is determined to kill more and faster again. But now, in Warsaw, the Jews will not go silently to slaughter. German SS and police units once again begin herding Jews together by the thousands. But this time around, bands of the Jewish Combat Organization and Jewish Military Union have been preparing for months and have been supplied by the Polish Home Army. They attack the German guards, take massive casualties themselves, but managed to rout the Nazis from the ghetto. Despite the attacks, up to 6,500 have already been deported to murder, and the resistance knows that the Nazis will come back. So the Jewish fighters start preparing for one last stand. Some 570 kilometers to the west in Berlin, it seems that Goebbels and Hitler are also looking at a possible last stand already now. On the 23rd, Goebbels writes, the Führer has read my proposals on total war and doesn't offer resistance. He even radicalizes my views in a good way. From now on, we shouldn't take the fate of the fatherland into account. The fatherland doesn't deserve to live when the men at the front have to sustain unprecedented dangers. If this is how the Nazis will carry on, they are forging the German people into a murder-suicide pact. On January 30th, while the RAF carries out daytime raids in Berlin and while the German soldiers are freezing and starving in the Stalingrad murder pit, Hitler addresses the nation on the 10th anniversary of his 1933 power grab. The victories that the German Wehrmacht and its allies have gained in this war are without equal in history. In view of the realization that there will be no victors and defeated in this war, but only survivors and annihilated, the National Socialist State will continue the fight with the same zealousness that the movement has called its own from the moment when it began to take power in Germany. I have already said on January 30th, 1942, that any weakling can bear victories, but it is fate that first tests the strong by its blows. It is already proved today that while they can destroy houses and men, they cannot break the spirit, which is only made stronger by this. What many German men and women were not aware of at the beginning of this war, they have in the meantime realized. The struggle, which was forced on us by the same enemies as in the year 1914, will decide whether our folk will live or be destroyed. It is winter in a war that has already brought total destruction and is now to bring more total destruction. 
It is an angry world, fueled by hatred, wrapped in the fog of war, where the lines between the righteous and the damnable is ever blurrier. It doesn't look like it will end anytime soon, and however it may end, it will be a bloody end for many millions more. Never forget. <laughs>